F1's 2026 rules are a massive source of wild speculation and controversy. Drivers having to downshift on straights, cars spinning out of control, extreme drag levels and over the top active aerodynamics. We've heard it all over the past year or so. The next generation of F1 car is less than two years from being reality, but the regulations still haven't been defined with a deadline of June 2024 fast approaching. And some people, especially those related to a certain championship winning team, are taking every opportunity to slam the direction F1 and the FIA are heading in and make quite dramatic claims about what the consequences will be. Most of the criticism has come from the Red Bull camp. Max Verstappen has warned F1 will become an engine formula, while Christian Horner and Adrian Newey are talking about bizarre techniques like revving the engine super high to charge the bigger batteries and use the greater electrical power that will be available. Red Bull has lost its bid to get the engine formula tweaked to reduce the ratio of the electrical power compared to the V6 engine as those rules have actually been set in stone for a while. It's the chassis regs we're all waiting on, with more and more meetings happening now to get things finalised. And that's what's put everything back in the firing line again. As far as Red Bull's concerned, F1 and the FIA have committed to a problematic engine formula that is requiring a lot of compromise to be made on the chassis side. There's always a grain of truth to such complaints, but no team ever behaves altruistically in F1, so it would be naive to think Red Bull only has the best interests of the championship at heart here. Many in the paddock believe that Red Bull's vocal opposition to the new rules just reflects some difficulties in the development of its first ever engine program, with Red Bull working on an in-house engine with some assistance from Ford for 2026. A lot of what has been claimed about the rules, whether by Red Bull or other parties, is rooted in outdated information or has exaggerated some issues that were never really serious topics or concerns or have since been rectified. So is it just competitive paranoia from Red Bull? We will address the concerns shortly, but first we need to properly understand why the rules are going in this direction at all. We've been creeping towards these new engine rules for a long time. They started to take shape way back in 2020, with preliminary discussions held even earlier. The single most significant change is the removal of the MGUH, which converts wasted heat to electrical energy and is effectively a sophisticated anti-lag system for the turbocharger. It was deemed too complex with too little road relevance for manufacturers and conferred a big advantage to the existing engine suppliers at a time when F1 was keen to get new manufacturers onto the grid. The loss of the MGUH is being compensated for by increasing the power from the MGUK to 350 kilowatts or around 470 brake horsepower, which will put the split between internal combustion engine and electrical power closer to 50-50. These were key parts of the 2026 engine objectives. Significant cost reduction, a way for newcomers to be competitive, a powerful environmental message and an emphasis on the show. Some people who long for a more traditional F1 or want to bring back V10s might struggle to reconcile emphasising the show with sticking with the turbo hybrid formula. But this is clearly the only direction F1 is heading in. And even if you don't agree with it, you have to admit it's been successful in terms of getting new manufacturers in. Not only is F1 keeping Mercedes, Renault and Ferrari on board, but it's also managed to tempt Honda back having originally planned to quit. It's got Ford coming in as a partner with Red Bull and Audi entering F1 for the first time altogether. But even though it's theoretically becoming cheaper and simpler, the scale of the technical undertaking is massive and given that, the restrictions for power unit development aren't as severe as on the chassis side where aero work is banned until the start of 2025. And as we mentioned, there aren't any technical rules for the car itself yet because that's still being discussed. There are some limitations on how much the six registered power unit manufacturers have been able to develop on dynos and how much money they can spend. But by and large, they've been permitted to work on the 2026 engines for years already with an established set of rules that's just being fettled. These twigs include an eye-catching new manual override function that can help a driver in a certain speed range, but we'll get to that in a moment. The first we heard of Red Bull's big 2026 concerns was about a year ago. You may remember them from such complaints as Horner talking about F1 risking a Frankenstein's monster of a car, or Verstappen saying that simulations of Monza had the car downshifting at full speed 500 meters before the end of the straight, or overly complicated active aerodynamics that would make the cars even heavier and reduce the control the drivers have. More recently, in 2024, Verstappen has reiterated his concern about active aero and the weight of the cars. We've also heard Nui's claim that the engines will be working flat chat as generators for the energy recovery system, with one example being revving the engines high mid-corner at places like the hairpin in Monaco. And there are suggestions that simulation work has revealed the cars are undrivable at full power on the straights in the low drag mode that will come with active aerodynamics. 
So how do we go about separating fact from fiction? Well, for starters, some of those assertions are correct. Who are we to question whether someone like Nui has a good grasp of the technical challenges associated with F1 2026? It's absolutely fair to say that the hybrid era of F1 has put a massive emphasis on energy recovery and compromising the car itself to make sure the engine gets what it needs. The 2026 engine's not being reduced to just a generator as Horner in particular has previously claimed, but it's not unrealistic to think it will be a unique new technical challenge for 2026 when you're dealing with a bigger battery and a revised DRS that has no MGUH and is deriving all its electrical power harvesting and deployment from the bigger MGUK. There was undeniably a time in the formation of the engine rules where either the electrical power would be useful for too small a part of the straight or there would be situations when cars would have to be charging the ERS on the straight with bizarre techniques that slow them down. But even by late 2023, that kind of talk was several months out of date, as those specific issues had been discovered much earlier in the development process and weren't as severe as made out. The FIA's single-seater director Nicholas Tombassis, who has overseen the new rules process, is now extremely confident that the refinements to the rules have killed all the speculation about having to downshift on the straights or recharge the batteries in strange ways and weird places on the track. This is partly due to slightly reducing how much energy can be recovered per lap, down from 9 megajoules to 8.5, with some leniency in the regulations to tweak this by half a megajoule either way, depending on the circuit layout. A different concern has been about the quality of racing the new rules will produce. The worry is that by prioritising the car's efficiency, which is one of the priorities of the rule set, that the cars will be so low drag and running at such high speeds on the straights that overtaking will be even harder. The FIA believes that the drag characteristics of the 2026 cars will still generate a decent tow effect. It's the DRS effect that will be reduced compared to what we know now. That's why the 2026 rules need more than just the existing DRS setup and where active aerodynamics come in. A more powerful low drag setting has its own consequences, but more on that shortly. The active aero will be supported by a manual override system in the ERS that the drivers can activate to access more electrical power at the very upper end of the speed range. How much of the MGUK's 350 kilowatts of power can be deployed will be carefully managed partly because the FIA doesn't want these super low drag cars to be hitting 400 kph on the straights. That would lead to lots of knock-on effects, like having to re-evaluate runoff areas and barrier arrangements, and probably re-homologate every circuit. So as the cars reach top speeds, the MGUK deployment will taper off after 290 km per hour, with no electrical power available once the car is travelling at 345 km per hour. This has been calculated together with the car's simulated drag profile the low drag effect should be more powerful at high speed. So the faster the cars go, the less resistance they should encounter, which offsets the reduction in electrical power. This should prevent any dramatic deceleration on straights and give the cars a similar velocity profile to what they have now. But because of the reduced DRS effect and the issue of the cars being lower drag in general, a bit more assistance is needed to aid overtaking. So when the manual override is activated, the MGUK will keep deploying the maximum 350 kilowatts of power up to 337 kilometers per hour. Then it will rapidly reduce and stop deploying once the car is doing 355 kilometers per hour. What hasn't been defined is how long the override function will last while the car stays in the speed range in which that function is usable. Will it be just a couple of seconds, for example, or until the driver slows down? It's also not known how many times a driver can use it per lap or per race. This will all be established in the sporting regulations once the final chassis rules are set. The important thing for now is that the provision has been built into the engine rules themselves. While the FIA claims to be happy with the weight characteristics it's observing from the 2026 cars in simulation, it accepts that some kind of overtaking assist is necessary. Between Active Aero, which we promise we will get to shortly, and the override function, the FIA has what it believes to be the best solution in terms of marrying up the car and engine characteristics and preserving the traditional skills of the driver to avoid F1 becoming one big automated energy manipulation exercise. That's also why Tom Bassis feels it's slightly simplistic to call the override a push to pass function. He doesn't like the implication it will just allow a driver to breeze past someone else as that's not the intention at all. The manual override is there to help the car behind to keep gaining on the car in front, even at the point where the tow and the DRS are minimally effective, and thus help drivers get close enough to attack into braking zones. 
it's obvious that the FIA and F1 prioritise the engine rules long in advance and now there's kind of a process of fudging the car design to work around the engines. But that's not all that's happening here because there's clearly some give and take. But how do active aerodynamics fit into this? It's not going to be as complex as Verstappen fears or as problematic as some rumours make out. There will be a drag reduction system element. This has been talked about as the whole rear wing backing off when the car is in low drag mode, either alongside or in place of the current DRS flap. In low drag mode, with significant torque from the engines, the cars can either be dealing with high power deployment or reach extremely high speeds while having very little downforce, especially if there's an open DRS flap as well. Unsurprisingly, one consequence of this is a massive balance shift towards the front, making the cars extremely nervous. This has spawned the rumour of cars spinning on straights or through minor curves in simulations and of having to run at F2 level pace to avoid losing control. The FIA is convinced the situation is not nearly so dramatic, but the plan will be refined to eliminate the worst of the problem. Aside from reducing drag with the rear wing, the only other active aero element will be to rebalance the car by reducing the downforce at the front. It will be reserved for use in designated areas, most likely just on the straights as with the current DRS, and not customizable through the lap. Teams will not be able to adjust the front and rear downforce levels constantly, which should alleviate the pass for stapping concern, because it clearly won't be automated and taken out of the driver's control with wing levels changing through the lap. And if you remember some initial claims that the active aero could include slowing down the leading car with some kind of reverse DRS, that's been emphatically dismissed as a myth by Tom Bassis. He says it was never seriously considered, and when it was mentioned by one or two people, it was dismissed after about two minutes. As for concerns about the impact the 2026 engine rules will have on car weight, there is a considerable increase for the power unit itself due to a bigger battery and MG UK. The MG UK is increasing from 7 kilos to 20 kilos total, and the battery from around 20 to 25 kilos to a minimum weight of 35 but there's also no MGUH, which is a saving of 4 kilos. All of that, plus some other ancillary part changes, up the total weight of the engine from 151 kilos to 185 in 2026. That is clearly not ideal and shows why Verstappen's worried about the weight getting even higher. And remember, Verstappen is massively unhappy by how heavy modern F1 cars are anyway. The good news is, as part of a wider set of 2026 chassis targets, there is a specific plan to take a lot more weight out of the chassis and other components. Some examples include the cars being 10cm narrower and 15cm shorter, and the wheels being slightly narrower as well, which will help to reduce the total weight of the chassis by around 40 to 50 kilos. So in the very worst case scenario, the total package weight should at least be contained, but realistically, it could reduce in total by around 10 or 15 kilos. Whatever the exact outcome, the cars are emphatically not going to be heavier than they are now unless something goes really wrong in the finalisation of the chassis rules. They should actually be a reasonable degree lighter and smaller, which will finally start to reverse the trend of cars just getting heavier and bigger. This has had an adverse effect on everything to do with F1 on track. How the cars handle, how they look, how they use the tyres, and as a result how raceable they are. The 2026 rules might actually be a first step towards addressing that. Could there be an even bigger gain if F1 didn't chase more electric power, even if it couldn't bin off the hybrids completely? Well, yes, of course. But as we said, F1 is only going one way technologically. And it's a small win, or at least a small mercy, that these controversial rules do seem to be on course to undo one of the worst trends of the modern era.